Centrifuge tests proved it to be effective at combating G-forces. But the team knew it wasn't the complete solution. The challenge now was to create a device to increase arterial pressure for the pilot without requiring his attention or effort, a so-called G-suit. Enter an expert weaver from Massachusetts named David Clark, eager to help with the war effort. He and Dr. Wood developed a suit that applied pressure on the arteries of the arms and legs. It was very effective, but pilots found it too uncomfortable to be practical. Dr. Wood and David Clark found another way to achieve the same results. They devised an inflatable, single-pressure, five-bladder system that could be slipped into a garment. This is exactly what, what was developed at that time. It hasn't changed since then. Equally important, the aeromedical team perfected a valve to reliably connect the suit to the plane's air pressure system. The concept of this new G-suit was accepted by both the Army and Navy Air Forces. Willy Messerschmitt, Germany's leading designer of fighter planes, saw a G-suit on a downed American pilot in 1943. He later recalled, we had nothing to match it. And I knew if American aviation science was so far ahead of us to make such a suit, Germany had lost the war already. Dr. Bulbullion had been working continuously on improvements to the BLB mask. The goal was to create an oxygen system that, like the G-suit, would not require the pilot's attention. Over a thousand experimental masks were made between 1941 and 1943. The ultimate result was called the A-14. It automatically provided the pilot with as much supplemental oxygen as needed. In the course of research, more than 300 subjects took more than 10,000 rides on the centrifuge, providing invaluable data. But pilots are notoriously skeptical of equipment that's only been tested in the laboratory. They want real-world proof before trusting their lives to a new invention. So the Mayo Aeromedical team requested a fighter plane and pilot to help them test their inventions. The pilot, Ken Bailey, wore a G-suit for protection as he took the plane through dizzying maneuvers. A research subject seated behind him experienced the resulting G-forces. Dr. Ed Lambert was the director of this line of experiments and a frequent volunteer. Dr. Lambert went on numerous test flights on the plane they called the G-Wiz. These real-world experiments proved the G-suit provided protection up to 7G. Practicing the M1 maneuver while wearing the suit could keep a pilot functioning at forces up to 9G. Soon the A-14 mask, the G-suit, and the inflating valve were all in mass production, supplying the pilots of both the U.S. Army and Navy. The aeromedical unit was also working on the special risks of parachuting out of aircraft at high altitudes. The team developed a portable bailout bottle of oxygen to help pilots stay conscious on the way down. It worked in the pressure chamber, but again, someone needed to test it on an actual high altitude parachute jump. Dr. Lovelace stepped forward. Now Lieutenant Colonel Lovelace he was the commanding officer of the Military Aeromedical Laboratory at Wright Field. Randy was enthusiastic, and he, he, when he got an idea, he wanted to carry it out, and he did. On July 1, 1943, the newspapers reported that the Rochester Surgeon Soldier had made the longest parachute jump in U.S. aviation history, bailing out at 40,200 feet. At that altitude, the opening shock of a parachute is tremendous. Lieutenant Colonel Lovelace immediately lost consciousness. His left glove was torn off, exposing his hand to 50 below zero temperatures. After floating for 24 minutes, he landed in a wheat field near Ephrata, Washington, and was rushed to a hospital. The experiment was deemed a success, but his frozen hand was permanently damaged. For his bravery, Lieutenant Colonel Lovelace was awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross by General Hap Arnold. When the war ended, the work of the Mayo Aeromedical Unit continued. 
German scientists had also been working on aviation medical issues. At the request of the federal air surgeon, members of the Mayo team went to Germany to interview these scientists and gather their reports. Mayo Clinic's contribution to the war effort was estimated at more than $2 million. For his leadership of the aeromedical unit, Dr. Baldes was awarded a special commendation from the War Department for exceptional civilian service. There were many lesser known heroes on the team. I had some of the best technicians. People like Lucy Cronin who worked with me for most of her career, or just, uh, they were just tremendous people, tremendously reliable and, uh, and very hard working. And a joy to be working with. After the war, the members of the aeromedical unit gratefully resumed their careers. Dr. Wood began doing early work with cardiac catheterization, using instrumentation methods developed for the centrifuge. Dr. Charlie Code went on to make significant contributions in gastroenterology. Dr. Ed Lambert is remembered for important work in EMG and neurology. The centrifuge itself was revived in the 1960s for work on NASA's mission to the moon. But eventually, the giant piece of equipment fell dormant. The historic centrifuge was disassembled on October 24, 1978, and cartered away for scrap. Today, only a few artifacts remain. However, the legacy of the wartime work of the Mayo Aeromedical Unit is substantial. A number of its innovations are still fundamental to aviation safety. The oxygen mask, the bailout bottle, full pressure suits, and much more. Today's G-suits operate on the same principle as the original. Every fighter pilot is still taught to combine the anti-G straining maneuver with the G-suit for his or her protection. The team's findings have also proven useful in cardiac catheterization pulmonary function testing, and other areas of contemporary medicine. Today, Mayo physicians and scientists are involved in both aerospace research and clinical care for the benefit of pilots, their crews, and their passengers. In May of 1993, the Space Shuttle Columbia carried Dr. Bernard Harris, a Mayo alumnus, into outer space. A historic teleconference was engineered by Mission Control at the Johnson Space Center and Mayo Clinic. One of the participants was Dr. Earl Wood. He reminded the world of the pioneering work of 50 years before, when the heroes of the Mayo Aeromedical Unit redefined the limits of humanity to journey through the air and eventually into space. Yeah.